Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7. The people who walk in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of Lord of hosts will do this. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are, who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her.
Christ. Today, we light again the candles of hope, peace, love, and joy. We speak of hope because God keeps his promises to us. Uh, we share joy because the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and minds with the presence of God. We show love because Jesus gave everything for us and led us to know and forgiveness of God. The fourth candle. We work for peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he calls us children to work for peace in his name. Now we light our last candle to remember the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As the prophets promised long ago, you have come to us once again, and with shepherds we fill with wonder and amazement. Lord, you come as a tiny, fragile baby, yet we know that you are God and you are with us. May the flame of this candle remind us that you are the light of the world and that we follow you. We will never walk in darkness but we'll have the true light of life. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.
recalls Christmas in 1944. That year, in the days leading up to Christmas Eve, Walter's father did the same thing he'd always done on Christmas Eve. He went into a room in the house, removed the outside doorknob so the kids couldn't get in, and he decorated a Christmas tree and stacked presents all around it. As their father carried on the great tradition, the Wagran kids did the same thing they always did. They stood outside the door, dreaming about what awaited them come Christmas morning. That is, all the children except Walter. Having turned 10 in 1944, Walter writes, I had that year become an adult, silent, solemn, watchful, and infinitely curious. While his brothers and sisters could barely contain their excitement, Walter held himself in severe restraint. Why? Well, the year before, his brother Paul had burst into tears. Walter writes, I can't even remember what it was that my brother was crying about, but I was horrified that pain could invade the holy ceremony that had become so important to me. And I was angry that my father had not protected my brother from tears. Because, he said, what if you hope and it doesn't happen? It's treacherous to hope. The harder you hope, the more vulnerable you become. And so, with all of that in mind, Walter decided that he was not going to make himself vulnerable like he had before. He was not going to hope. He was not going to be caught off guard whenever, whatever might happen when his father opened the door on Christmas Eve. Well, when the time finally came, Walter stood before his anxious brothers and sisters the only one with a frown. Walter's father opened the door to the room and all the wagger and children ran in, gasping and giggling over what they saw. That is, every child except Walter. Walter stood in the doorway, gazing at the tree and the piles of presents. And then he turned to look at his father who stood there, waiting. What he saw caused Walter to have an emotional outburst of his own that Christmas Eve. He writes, There was my father, standing in the center of the room and gazing straight at me. And this is the wonder fixed in my memory. The man was filled with a yearning, painful expectation on account of me. This was new, the thing I'd never seen before, that my father too had trusted the promises against their disappointments. But among the promises which my father had committed his soul to, his hope to, his faith to, the most important one was this, that his eldest son could soften and be glad. He gazed at me, Walter writes, waiting, waiting for me, waiting for his Christmas to be received by his son and returned to him again. And I began to cry. I cried out, oh, my father. I cried, Walter writes, glad and unashamed, because what was this room for so long locked which I was entering? Why, it was my own heart. And why had I been so afraid? Because I thought I'd find it empty a hard, unfeeling thing. But there in the room was my father. And there in my father was the love that I had furnished this room with, trusting and yearning, desiring joy. Walter writes, I leaned my cheek against the door jam and grinned like a grown-up 10-year-old and sobbed as if I were a two-year-old. My father moved to the middle, from the middle of the room where he was and walked toward me, still empty-handed. But he spread out his hands and gathered me into himself. And I put my arms around his larger body, and so both of us together were full. This Christmas, despite all of the turmoil going on in our world, God yearns for and desires your joy. Please don't just stand there trying to steel yourself against any disappointment that stems from any reason. 
much less any reasoning from a difficult year. Instead, embrace the love that he has for you. Pull, put your trust in the Lord and dare to hope in his promise. Don't stand in the doorway, but open the, the inner being of your heart to him who fills it with love and peace and hope and joy. And in, fill it with his promise, his promise that he is Emmanuel, God with us. God is with you. God is with all of us this Christmas season and forevermore. Merry Christmas to you. Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was laying in a manger. When, the, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told, to, been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which, they were, ju which were just as they had been told. On a cold Christmas Eve morning in 1818 in Orbendorf, a mountain village in Austria, a lonely figure trudges down the road. It's the local vicar, Father Joseph Moore. And he was on his way to visit his friend, Franz Gruber, 
who lived in the neighboring town of Arnsdorf. Moore brought with him a poem that he'd written some two years earlier. He desperately needed a carol for that evening's midnight mass, which was now only a few hours away. And he hoped that his friend, Gruber, who was the church's choir master and organist, could set his poem to music. Gruber looked at it and said that yes, he could, and so that afternoon, he composed a melody for Moore's poem. However, they couldn't play the carol on the local organ because it had been put out of commission by flooding. And so Gruber composed the music for four-part accompaniment on a guitar. And a few hours after Gruber finished his composition and he and Morris performed this new song at St. Nicholas Church in Orban. That evening, the sounds of a brand new carol broke the Stille Nacht in the mountain village of Orban. Stille Nacht one of the most beloved poems, one of the most beloved carols of all time. A reminder to be still and wait on the Lord. Still a night, or in English, silent night. Silent.